numbers go up. Welcome everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the June monthly meeting. Thank you, John. John just put the, a link to the agenda into the chat. So good evening, everybody. It's a nice June evening. I, looks like the, it's getting a little gray here in Jersey, but hopefully we'll have some more sun soon. So welcome everybody. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. I'm going to let um, give everyone a chance to come in. Please don't forget if you are going to write a comment in the chat to make sure it's addressed to panelists and all and attendees. Otherwise, only the panelists will see it. So please make sure to put the attendees on as well. Okay, so let's see. All right, so people are slowly coming in. So welcome everybody. And we're going to have a very interesting discussion tonight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and then followed by some organic business, but it shouldn't be too, too long tonight. And most of the time we'll be with our wonderful guest speaker, Sarah Schulman, who we'll be introducing in just a moment. And then we'll have a few committee reports. Again, the link is to the agenda is in the chat. So if everyone could have a look at that and we'll give a few more minutes. Yeah, thank you, John, because as people are coming in, they need to be able to see it. So I hope everyone's well. I hope everyone, I mean, we all got washed out for Memorial Day, but I hope everybody's dried off by now. I know my plants got a, a good soaking, which was good. And the guests at the observatory were not very happy, but at least Monday turned out to be a good day. And I know I've been seeing nice pictures of people touring, which is great, including our own Mike Morgenthaler just got back from a student group, which is such a good sign, <laughs> such a good sign. Now, how many students, how many were in the group, Mike? Uh, it was a small group, just 15, but uh, oh. for the first time back, I didn't mind that too much, so. Yeah, very nice, very nice. And was Washington busy? Uh, not super. I mean, certainly nothing compared to a normal Memorial Day weekend. There were, I saw about 10 other buses floating around, but um, there are a lot of FIT visitors there, but uh, student groups, certainly not nearly as busy. Right, right. Well, it's to be expected. Yeah, we're at the observatory. We're getting more and more people, lots of South American travelers. So hearing a lot of Spanish and some Indian groups too, which was interesting. So people are coming, people are coming which is very good. So we'll wait one more minute and then we will get started. So, um, and yeah, everyone who's a medical tourist, <laughs> yeah. And and um, just revenge tourism. What it's, was that? It's, I'm being very serious because a lot of my guests, they know that they can get free uh, vaccination here in New York City. It's out there and about, especially a lot of South Americans. That is fabulous. Well, it's one thing I do mention actually, when I do my presentations, <clears throat> When I do my presentations, I say, you know, New York's open. We're a full service city. Even get a vaccine. You know, you can see the parks, get some great food and get a vaccine. Oh, good. Oh, and, and Tony, you've been doing tours for experience for us. Very, very good. So that's great. It's all good news. People are coming back. Um, it's exactly what we want to hear. All right. So uh, let's just go over. I'll go the, over the agenda quickly. I think the numbers have slowed down a bit. Some more people are still coming in, but um, thank you. John keeps putting it in. Thank you very much. So uh, after my report, our guest speaker tonight is Sarah Schulman. Uh, Kevin Lawrence will be introducing her and moderating the discussion. And so we will be taking questions in the Q&A part at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also put them into chat. I'll be keeping an eye on them. But remember, if you are writing anything in chat and you would like everyone to see that, make sure, be sure to address to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, only the panelists will see it. Uh, and then we'll have four committee reports from Education, Government Relations, Industry Relations, and the Membership Committee. And if there's any new business, if there's anything people would like us to bring up, um, please feel free to put that in the chat as well and we will discuss as needed, okay? So why don't we get started? And I don't have a lot to say except welcome everybody. And we were chit-chatting a moment ago about how wonderful it is to see 
everything is opening up and people are out and about they're um you know visiting places tourists are coming in um, people are staying in hotels going out to dine in restaurants and it's really uh thanks to you know just trying to just we made it through basically over a year but it's also thanks of course to getting vaccinated so if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet there is no reason to wait get your vaccine get out there get out and about and enjoy the city again and enjoy uh, tourists again and enjoy um, touring again. Um, so like I said, we're gonna have a great discussion tonight. And, but before, uh, before we really get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that unfortunately due to um, personal matters, Christina Lombardi has stepped down from the board and we are very, very sorry that she's not going to be a board member. Um, but we also wish her wish her all the best. And uh, we want to thank her for everything she's done. As you all may remember, she was our editor and our guide for the guides guide, um, the, our Virgil that we had over a co um, over the you know the worst months of COVID. And she did a fantastic job with that. And I have to say on behalf of everyone on the board, we so appreciated her energy, her talent, uh, her good spirits. She was really really a great addition. So we are sorry that she will not be with us anymore on the board, but she is still, of course, a GANIC member. And uh, we are currently discussing and looking at a way to um, fill her position as, um, as member at large. And so we will keep you all posted about that. Um, we'll be discussing that more at our next board meeting in a few weeks. Now, with regards to opening and with regards to everything uh, that's happening around the city, of course, the best thing is the numbers have gone way down. I mean, way, way, way down. Okay, yesterday, zero COVID deaths were reported in New York City, and the positivity rate is under one. Okay, so it's 0.8 something percent. So again, that's vaccine. That's people who've been careful this whole time. And now we can emerge from our cocoons and get out there. Um, but speaking of emerging from our cocoons, it's really, I know it's, it's very hard, I think, for a lot of us. Some of us want to get out there and we're ready, you know, going gangbusters and other of us are taking a little more time. And I just like to remind everyone that, you know, just go at your own pace and be kind to yourself. You may feel up to it, you may not feel up to it, and either option is good. And I have to say that I've had to work on my stamina of guiding again. I'm back at the observatory and now we'll be to four days a week. And I'm just glad we've sort of ratcheted it up very slowly because I certainly didn't have the stamina to be doing my eight hour shift standing and talking and standing and talking. So um, it's it's tiring, it's tiring. It's physically tiring and it's mentally tiring too to be out and about again. So, you know, be kind to yourself and take care of yourself. And we do have some good news coming up because of um, the vaccines and because of things opening up, we are starting to have more in-person events. I hope you all saw some beautiful photos of another in-person fam tour. Monia did that up in the Heights. And we are planning already to have our in-person um, uh, annual general meeting that will be in September. And uh, Tony DeSanti and membership is also working on an in-person networking happy hour. So remember those fun events when everyone's like close together in a space? We can do that again. So we're going to have that. It'll be at um, Azalea. Thanks so much to um, Libby and uh, opening up her, her restaurant to us. And so we'll be in Azalea. And so stay tuned. We'll be coming at the end of the month, okay? So at the end of June. So yet another reason to make sure you get your vaccine because it's likely we will be requiring gets to be vaccinated so we can all be together and we can all be safe. And um, I don't know about you, but I'm dying to see people in person. I had a little hint of it when we had our in-person board meeting and it was just fantastic. It was just so nice to see people that they're not in a little rectangular box sitting on um, a cookie tin on my desk. So I'm looking forward to that and I hope you all are too. So keep your eyes open uh, for that. So that's really all I have to say. Again, um, get out there, 
be safe still, but enjoy the sunshine, enjoy our city opening up. Our little organic guide butterflies are starting to, to come out and um, have a great meeting. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin now. Kevin will introduce our speaker and then I'll be back for the reports in a little while. So take it away, Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you, Emma, and uh, welcome everyone and happy Pride Month. Uh, Today, we are incredibly honored to have Sarah Schulman be here to speak with us. Uh, Sarah is a novelist, a playwright, a screenwriter, a nonfiction writer, a activist, an academic, a organizer of film festivals, and an AIDS historian. She has published 20 works of, of uh, 20 books, I should say, and her latest is Let the Record Show, a political history of ACT UP New York 1987 to 1993. It's just been published by Ferrar, Strauss and Giroux and I'm actually putting a link into where you can obtain that book. It's been widely reviewed even in the New York Crimes as Sarah might tell us about how they used to refer to this as an ACT UP. Um, she is also distinguished professor of the City University of New York at the College of Staten Island and she's a member of the Adv advisory board of Jewish Voice for Peace. And I'm so honored and grateful and excited that you've agreed to be with us, Sarah. Your work is so rich. I'm gonna stop gushing and just jump right into asking you questions. Um, at the Great. beginning of your book, uh, Let the Record Show, you talk about how in your own personal oral interviews with all of the participants who come from such diverse backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, uh, different sexualities, different relationships to people with AIDS. Um, you ask them, you know, so what, what motivated them to first get involved with ACT UP? And they seemed a little bit bewildered with the question. So by, as a way of introduction, I wanted to ask you back in 1987 as a young lesbian novelist and a journalist, um, what motivated you to get involved with ACT UP? And in thinking about that question, do you sort of understand why people were bewildered by that question? Or did you expect that people were going to sort of uh, have a similar motivation of what motivated you to join ACT UP? Well, um, I dropped out of college in 1979 and came back to New York. I'm a na native New Yorker. And I became a girl reporter working on a bunch of gay and feminist and left wing sort of underground newspapers, community based newspapers, where everyone worked for free and who covered our community, which the mainstream press did not. And at that point, I was sent by the New York Native, which was the gay male newspaper to City Hall. We had Mayor Ed Koch, the closeted mayor. And the issue at the time was that we did not have a gay rights bill in New York, which meant that gay people could be fired kicked out of their apartments, refused public accommodation, such as restaurants and hotels. So it was quite a serious situation and I would be going to city hall, you know, press conferences. Mr. Mayor, Sarah Shulman, New York native, when are we getting a gay rights bill? In 1981 is when AIDS was first noticed by science. We now know that AIDS probably was hundred years old at that time probably in America since the 40s and certainly in New York since the 60s and 70s. But science only noticed a pattern in 1981. And the first public announcement was a famous article in the New York Times, July 3rd, 1981, 41 cases of rare cancer found in homosexuals in San Francisco. Now, just to give a little context, um, for those first five years after that, the government did absolutely nothing and 40,000 people died in this country. Pharmaceutical companies did nothing. They tried to recycle failed cancer drugs because they saw a potential market, but they were not doing any of the research that needed to be done. It was very, very chaotic. Um, in New York, there were service organizations like God's Love We Deliver that would bring people uh, home-cooked meals, but there was no political response. And during those years, I was covering AIDS for the gay press. I wrote about pediatric AIDS. I wrote about women being excluded from experimental drug trials. I even covered the closing of the bathhouses when the city closed the bathhouses, which is kind of interesting since women were not allowed in the bathhouses. And it shows you how chaotic the coverage was at the time. Journalists were dying, editors were dying. The mainstream press was ignoring the crisis. It was hard to even know what the stories were. Then when ACT UP 
uh, formed in March 1987, I joined that following July. And I stayed in ACT UP until uh, about 1993. The, the reason I was asking people was, you know, there were a handful of straight people in ACT UP. And we, I always would ask them, and there was one parent, one parent of a person with AIDS who joined ACT UP, that's it. And I would ask people, why do you think you were different than everybody else? The rest of the country was stigmatizing, victimizing, abandoning people with AIDS. Why did you join? And they go, what do you mean? <laughs> they couldn't understand why other people hadn't joined. They were just exceptional individuals. Well, we're grateful that they did. Um, now, as you just said, and uh, as you remind people throughout the book, let the record show that AIDS is still a lethal pandemic that continues to, to affect thousands of people here in the city, around the country, and many more worldwide. And yet you also mentioned that you were active in ACT UP until 1993, but of course ACT UP is still active. And right. so I'm just really curious, um, why did you choose to frame your book, your oral history from 1987 to 1993? Is it your own personal um, sort of trajectory of you then joining the Lesbian Avengers? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Or did it have to do with the, the sort of small break that the, the treatment, again, uh, the treatment action group made from ACT UP? Um, I'm just curious, I guess, the real upshot of the question is, was there something distinctly different about ACT UP in 1987 to 1993 that distinguishes it from post-1993 yes, ACT UP? There was. Uh, so the reason for this book is not nostalgia. This is so that uh, the book was written so that activists working today, and there are huge numbers of people in this country who are trying to make change right now, can get access to the strategies and tactics that ACT UP used because we really were the most recent social movement in America to be successful. And that's why it's important to have this information. Uh, now those six years were incredibly productive. Let me tell you some of ACT UP's victories during that time. ACT UP forced pharmaceutical companies to completely change the way they research treatments for HIV. Uh, AIDS, for people who don't know, it's a horrible illness and it's a terrible death. Basically, you have no immune system and young people would develop dementia, blindness, um, the nerves in their legs would swell, people could not retain nutrition. Each of these symptoms was called an opportunistic infection. So ACT UP forced pharmaceutical companies to focus on those opportunistic infections and to develop treatments for them even though the market share was less. ACT UP forced the Food and Drug Administration to allow people to access experimental drugs that had not been approved. ACT UP made needle exchange legal in New York City, which transformed the crisis here. ACT UP confronted the Catholic Church when they tried to intervene to have condom, condom distribution stopped in the public schools, and we were successful. ACT UP started Housing Works, that organization for homeless people with AIDS. ACT UP also, and this is very important, transformed the way that women with AIDS were treated in this country by running a four-year campaign to change the official definition of what symptoms you had to have to have an AIDS diagnosis to include women's symptoms. And what this, what this did was it allowed women with AIDS to get benefits and to get access to drugs. And today, any woman with HIV in the world who takes medication is taking something that was tested on women because of ACT UP's achievement. And ACT UP really transformed the way queer people and people with AIDS saw themselves and the way the world saw them. Because prior to ACT UP, queer people were not represented accurately in television and certainly not people with AIDS. And ACT UP forced a transformation. So it had really, really concrete wins. Yeah, it, it is amazing how much was done by ACT UP and by so many dedicated volunteers. I'm just curious in the demographics now, the people who are most in need of that type of direct action, um, what do you see, you know, a lot of wealthy white gay men, for example, can afford the types of pharmaceuticals that make AIDS supposedly a manageable disease or HIV a manage manageable disease now. What area do you think that are the most in need of the types of, of actions that you just described and what demographics out there do you think? Let me just say that any, you know, it's not, you know, people don't pay for their AIDS meds. Okay, there's, I mean, you do pay, but there are, there's insurance and each state has a different situation 
where you live geographically determines a lot about your condition, but it's not that you just have to pay over the counter. But what is, the, the problem is that we don't have a logical and coherent healthcare system. And um, if your insurance has a very high deductible, you, it can be prohibitive or obstructive for people unless they can qualify for subsidy. So it is a complex system. But in New York City, people who die of AIDS are usually homeless people, people outside of the healthcare system who show up in the emergency room um, and are then diagnosed when they're highly symptomatic. So the real problem now is not the medications. We have the medications. The problem is that, as we all know, the United States does not have a coherent uh, healthcare system, logical healthcare system. Yeah. And a social safety net that can catch those types of people for, that might become homeless. Um, so in addition to, to looking at the history of AIDS, Let the Record Show is also a record of just what it is to be an action-oriented political group. Um, and it seems like, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a big impetus behind your writing, Let the Record Show, was to provide current and future uh, direct action political movements a full record of both the successes and some of the failures of ACT UP as sort of a template for thinking about how they would want to develop strategies for whatever their own agenda might be. I'm just curious, do you think other activist movements with since ACT UP like Occupy Wall Street or most immediate, immediately and most specifically the Black Lives Matter, do you think that they're looking at ACT UP's history to learn from that history, um, and specifically the role of Black trans women in uh, Black Lives Matter. Do you think that they look to the role of feminists, the trans people Blacks have played in ACT UP, or do you think that they are largely unaware of that, of the contributions those communities made to ACT UP? And uh, are there specific successes and failures that you would like most to highlight that other political activists could learn from ACT UP's history? There's a lot, you, you just, you brought up a lot of different issues there. Um, I think it's very hard for people to get activist history. I mean, in order to figure out what active strategies were, I had to interview 188 people over 20 years. So uh, cohering, cohering all of that, it's not information that's readily available. So I, you know, I think that people are inspired by what they know of ACT UP, but younger and younger people have never heard of ACT UP. So that's one of the reasons for for pulling this all together. In terms of Black Lives Matter, I think it's actually the other way around. You know, I think in my generation, I was born in 1958, and I think queer people, gay people born in the 50s and 60s, we had, as queer children, we had no idea that there was gonna be a gay community there for us. And we, we saw black resistance on television. We saw nonviolent civil disobedience. We saw direct action. And I think we really internalized a kind of identification with, with that resistance. Because when I was later researching and I went back to look at definitions of direct action, I looked at Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail in which he lays out what direct action really is. And it's exactly what ACT UP did, even though we didn't study it or talk about it or even reference it. So there was a zeitgeist of influence from the black movement. But there also was another source of influence in ACT UP, which is the movements that ACT UP members had been in previously. And so just to give the context, the gay movement was not a discrete movement, but the reason that there was a, an independent gay movement is because the rest of the left didn't want gay people in their organizations. The Communist Party kicked out gay people, the civil rights movement notoriously sidelined Bayard Rustin, the feminist movement purged lesbians, and that's why there was a, a separate gay movement. Now, there are openly gay and trans people and queer people in leadership of all the radical movements in this country, whether it's the movement for black lives, whether it's Palestine solidarity, whether it's um, movements for immigration reform, that the radical part of gay liber queer liberation is now present in all radical movements openly. But uh, at that time when ACT UP started, there were older gay men who had been in gay liberation, but a lot of younger men had not been politically active. There were people who had come from civil rights movement, from the Black Panthers, 
from Latin American student movements against fascism, and certainly from reproductive rights and feminism. And those tended to be the people who, even though they were, there were fewer of them, because ACT UP was a predominantly white male organization, people who came from previous movements had a lot of influence on the politics of ACT UP. So that, that, that's a nice segue into my next question, which has to do, of course, it's, it is Pride Month. And one of the, the salient points that you make and let the record show is that you can't conflate AIDS history with the trajectory of uh, queer civil rights history or queer liberation history. Even though I think, you know, in a Venn diagram, they would, of course, significantly overlap with one another, but they're not synonymous with one another. And so I'm just curious, as we're getting all ready to celebrate Pride Month, uh, has there always been a sort of amicable re relationship between the gay liberation movement, and in particular, the Pride March organizers um, and ACT UP uh, throughout its period of activity, including till today, especially as you consider that Pride has become increasingly celebratory rather than confrontational or political in nature and even corporatized. Um, and maybe you can tell us also a little bit about the history and intent behind the, the Dyke March as well. I think it's, it's related to this issue. Well, you know, the act of people, you, you're more likely to find them in the drag march, the trans march, and in Reclaim Pride and the Dyke March than you are in the corporate pride. You know, so there, there has been an alienation there for quite some time. Um, the Dyke March was started when there was a march on Washington, uh, I think it was 92 or 93, and uh, I can't remember what year, but it was a national march, and I think it was 93, and people came from all over the country, and the Lesbian Avengers had just been founded and decided to have a lesbian march with no permit. So they handed out, we handed out little club cards and 20, 22,000 women gathered and marched around Washington, DC. And that was the first Dyke March. And so that started the tradition of having no police permit and no corporate sponsorship. And then people went home to their countries, to their towns, to their cities, and they did Dyke Marches there, hopefully on the same model. So the Dyke March in New York has never had a permit or a corporate sponsorship. And now that there's a big fight about pride and about whether the police should be in pride or not, um, more, more people, Peter Staley from ACT UP being one of them, have called for the Pride March to dissolve and for everything to return to reclaim pride, to get away from the corporate control. I mean, do you think that's possible? Someday, I think it could be possible. I mean, you know, the gay movement started out as a movement against police violence. That was its origin. And now that that's a national call, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Can you explain just a little bit to our audience about what Reclaim um, Pride, the, the Reclaim uh, Pride marches? Yes, it's an annual march. I think at this year, I think it's June 27th at 2.30 at Bryant Park. And it, it's organized by more political people. It's more in the tradition of gay liberation and it has no corporate sponsorship. Thank you. Um, and you guys can find that online, but probably after we have this conversation, I'll also link to a lot of where you can find information about this and put it in the chat room. Um, so my next question has to do with the fact, you know, we as tour guides, this is what your audience is, our members like to seek out specific sites where we can focus on a narrative specific of specific aspects of New York City history. And this is, as you mentioned, the 40th anniversary of when the New York Times brought AIDS into the public discourse. And it also coincides with the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And this got me thinking and, and made me remember a particular salient piece of a previous book that you published back in 2012, um, The Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost Imagination. And I just wanna read a passage that I think will get, it's very thought provoking and that uh, our audience will, will really appreciate. You mentioned that as of the writing, when you were writing this August 16th, 2008, 81,542 people had died of AIDS in New York City. And then you say the deaths of these 81,542 New Yorkers who were despised and abandoned, who did not have rights or representation, who died because of the neglect of their government and families has been ignored. 
This gaping hole of silence has been filled by the deaths of 2,752 people murdered by outside forces. The disallowed grief of 20 years of AIDS death were replaced by ritualized and institutionalized mourning of the acceptable dead. In this way, 9-11 is the gentrification of AIDS, the replacement of deaths that don't matter with deaths that do. It is the centerpiece of supremacy ideology, the idea that one person's life is more important than another's, that one person deserves rights that another does not deserve, that one person deserves representation that the other cannot be allowed to assess, that one person's death is negligible if he or she was poor, a person of color, a homosexual living in a state of oppositional sexual disobedience, while another death matters because that person was a traitor, cop, or office worker presumed to be performing the job of capital. And you write capital with a capital C. Um, I, I always, that was just like such an eye opener for me when I read that. And now, but since then, uh, there has, of course, been a AIDS memorial that has been built. Um, and I'm just very curious about your assessment of its design, uh, whether you think it's successful, whether it sort of meets the same uh, commemoration that you get in the 9-11 memorial, especially in its relationship, it's maybe bitterly ironic relationship with the Rudin Management Company and what they did to the old St. Vincent Hospital right across the way from it, uh, but they also you know, paid for it, I guess you could say. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with what you're talking about with this con a wider concept of gentrification. Um, yeah, I mean, you said it better than I can. I mean, that park, so there's a long quote from Walt Whitman that's etched into the ground. And of course, Walt Whitman was gay, but what does that have to do with AIDS? You know, AIDS is not just about gay people and it's not just about gay poetry, right? It's a, a, a story of a despised group of people with no rights who were abandoned by their families and their government and who joined together with a terminal disease for which there were no treatments and forced this country to change against its will. That is the actual story. So it's not, it's nice to have a nice quiet place to sit, but that's not what, what AIDS, the legacy of AIDS is about. What it's about is that people who do not have rights and are marginal can force change in this country, but it takes a long time and you have to be very focused and effective. And I try to lay out the ways that ACT UP was effective. So one of the things that I do in the book is that I juxtapose three different campaigns that were conducted by three different constituencies inside ACT UP so that you can see that the strategy is really determined by your social position. So in one case, you have Larry Kramer, who went to Yale with the president of, of, um, uh, of a pharmaceutical company. And he was able to call him and he met, we had meetings between members of ACT UP who had gone to Harvard, who were ex uh, stockbrokers, with pharma in their offices with catered lunch and lots of civility and discourse. Now juxtapose that with the campaign to change the CDC definition of AIDS to include women. That was a four year campaign. It was conducted mostly by women, by HIV positive women, women of color and poor women and by white lesbians for the most part inside ACT UP. It took them two years to even get a meeting with Fauci. It, they won after four years, but the leaders of the movement who were HIV positive, some of them were already dead by that time. They had to do all kinds of crazy things. They handcuffed themselves to officials. They broke into people's offices. They screamed to people in airports. They surrounded the NIH, you know, and by using those kinds of tactics, ultimately they were able to win. Then I juxtapose that with the movement of active and former drug users in ACT UP. Uh, that was really crazy. You know, two people OD'd and died. One guy stole $10,000 from the organization. But they did illegally exchange needles, were arrested, had a trial, and won. And because of that, needle exchange is now legal in New York City. So what you learn by juxtaposing those things is that anybody can win change. But they have to be very, very focused. And respectability politics only works for some people. For many people, it is not appropriate. So how do you think that that type of effort from those 
to other marginalized, more marginalized groups, uh, how do you think that they could effectively be memorialized? Or do you think that that's important? Well, it's very important. First of all, I'd like to see the names of people who died of AIDS. That's one thing. And then, you know, I'm trying, we're trying with the ACT UP Oral History Project, which people could find at actuporalhistory.org, which has been visited by 14 million people so far, to make the activism and the social change, the legacy of the AIDS crisis. Because there's so many people in this country right now who want change so badly on so many different levels. And it, it would be so helpful to people to have concrete information about how to achieve that. And that would be our greatest legacy. Yeah. I have to say, I was so disappointed. You know, Jenny Holzer, her early work, because she's the one who, who's, who wrote that passage from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself on there. Her early work was so oppositional and it was so much about so many of the things that you're talking about. Um, it seemed like a kind of a sellout to be perfectly honest. Um, um, okay. Uh, the next question that I wanted to ask you is that it has to do with other aspects of your work. Um, a lot of, maybe you want to introduce people to your relationship from your novel. Um, uh, oh gosh, the title of it, the people. Uh, people in trouble. People in trouble. I'm sorry. Yes. People in trouble and its relationship to rent. Uh, but it has to do with what, with a lot of issues about the representation of both ACT UP and people with AIDS. Um, you've been an outspoken critic of the distortion of AIDS history and the AIDS activist community in mainstream media, both nonfiction and fiction, uh, which all too often displaces the narrative focus onto a heterosexual white privileged hero narrative arch and occludes or outright ignores the diverse activist support system who are largely the true saviors of so many suffering uh, people with AIDS. And you can, of course, uh, feel free to correct my attempt to try to succinctly state what your, your critique is. But um, one of the most prominent recent representation of ACT UP and the New York City and the community that was affected by AIDS most recently is in the FX TV series Pose, which is a Ryan Murphy and Brad Fulchuk uh, vehicle. And it, it represents AIDS and, and ACT UP community in very different ways. Uh, I think one of the most touching scenes, which I was very surprised coming from a, a very, you know, Ryan Murphy is a very campy type of director in my opinion, but their visit to Heart Island, I found really moving um, and, and something that I don't think ordinarily has been represented. Um, but so I'm just curious that this pose, it features HIV plus black trans and gays in the ballroom scene of the 1980s and the 90s being involved in ACT UP. And there was one particular example that was quite famous at the beginning of the second um, the second season of this series where they, they joined the Stop the Church protest. Um, and I'm just curious about your take on these representations and if they come closer, in your opinion, to a more faithful depiction of a, in a fictional work to AIDS history in New York City. And if not, what if any type of depiction of AIDS history would you like to see in popular media? Or do you, again, do you think that that's the goal? Is it that, AIDS needs to be in popular media, or should there be another goal that you would like to see? No, I think, you know, I, what I'd love to see is representation that inspires younger people to take action, and that helps people take the responsibility to create the solutions. This was one of the strengths of ACT UP. They were not in an infantilized relationship to the powers that be begging them to fix it. ACT UP would actually design the solution and then present to the FDA, for example, how they could get experimental drugs that had not been approved to people who needed it. You know, and, and so once ACT UP had a solution that was reasonable, winnable, and doable, and the powers that be refused to do it, that's when they would do theatrical direct action to communicate through the media to the public to pressure the institutions to respond. And, any kind of representation that shows that strength and that creativity and inspires people to do the same and to take the same kind of responsibility would be very exciting. I mean, you know, pose is very complex, but I will just comment on the representation of Stop the Church. 
So uh, 1989 ACT UP disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral because Cardinal O'Connor was opposing needle exchange and was opposing condom distribution in the public schools. And um, ACT UP agreed to do a silent die-in inside the church. But once we got into the church, Michael Petrellis, a member of ACT UP, jumped up on the pew and started screaming at O'Connor, you're killing us, you're killing us in his New Jersey accent. Stop it, stop it. And it was all chaos, a pandemonium, please, people screaming and all this kind of thing. Now there was one trans woman that, we, that I know of who was prominent in ACT UP, Kathy Otter. She was elected as the facilitator so she was in a position of honor and respect inside the organization and she was arrested at St. Patrick's, but she was white. As far as I know, there were no uh, black trans women in ACT UP. Um, and it was interesting that when that representation came up, two people of color who were in ACT UP, uh, Moises Augusto from Puerto Rico from the island and Robert Vasquez, who's New York and Black Puerto Rican from New York, posted on Facebook, why not represent us? Instead of writing us out of the story who were there and then inventing other people who weren't there. You know, and I saw that they had a desire to be, to have their story told and that's legitimate. So that's, you know, so that's why one of the reasons that the first chapter in my book is on Puerto Ricans in ACT UP. And actually there were quite a few Latinos in ACT UP. I have three, chapters on Latinos in ACT UP. There were four Latino related committees. And in the final chapter, which is a very interesting conversation with Cesar Carrasco, who was a member of the Latino caucus, he names about 35 people who were in ACT UP. So the, you may ask, how come they weren't represented? One of the reasons is that in the 1980s, the entire media was white and male. So was the government, so was the private sector. And for gay men who were part of that apparatus, many of them were in the closet. So when the media would come to act up, they would see other white men, that's who they would represent. And in fact, in 1990, I had a public debate with Larry Kramer at a, a gay writers conference, where I was like, Larry, you know, next time the media calls you, why don't you pass it on to a woman or person of color and act up? And he said, but Sarah, shouldn't we use our best people? So, you know, he had bias, right, that he um, did not overcome. Yeah. So I'm just, I, I want to tease out from you just a little bit more, Sarah. When you see that being represented in Pose on FX, and you know that there is this the same white male, actually, perspective that's sort of writing this Black trans history, um, well, I wouldn't say that. It's a wish. It's a utopian wish that things were different than they are, than they were. But what, right. how it really was is also not known. Right. And it becomes a replacement history. Yeah. But do you also think that, like, I, I'm going to be very personal here, and I'm going to say that the first time I became aware of ACT UP as a very young uh, teenager at that particular event in my household. It was the only time I can ever remember my family getting in a discussion about gay. They probably all knew that I was gay, but that stopped the church. I come from an Irish Catholic family. That really got things, uh, you know, got very heated. I can remember my grandfather saying, and it really shocked me because he said, why are they throwing condoms at nuns? Why aren't they down in those bathhouses throwing them at those men? And, and it really shocked me that he knew what a bathhouse was. I think that's what probably what most shocked me. Well, first, no one was throwing condoms at nuns. But actually, that was a real turning point for ACT UP because it was on the front page of every newspaper, I mean, in the world. I mean, that was our great moment. It was homosexuals with AIDS dare to stand up to the Catholic Church. Right. You know, that was the change. And it's interesting, one of the people that I write about is Donna Binder, who was a photojournalist. And she would bring photos of act of actions to photo editors. And they would say, no, no, we don't want that. We want emaciated people lying in bed dying. And after Stop the Church, they wanted those photographs of people fighting for their lives. You know, it really changed the images, uh, the image of people with AIDS around the world. Yeah. But I guess what I wanted to say is that it, it also sort of set the tone of how I think a lot of young gay people thought of ACT UP, that it was primarily angry and uh, very aggressive. And there's there was such a big, it was like a black cloud that was hanging over a lot of people's heads. So when you talk about this sort of 
um, aspirational. I forget the term that you used in, in propose. Um, that a utopian it, wish, yes. Utopian wish, okay, yeah. Um, do you think that, do, I mean, I know that you have particular complaints about Kushner as well, but do you think that Angels in America is also a utopian wish representation? No, it's the opposite. I mean, the most rewarded representations of AIDS, you know, follow some real distortions. Usually pe gay people are depicted as alone. They don't have a community and they don't have a political movement and they're dependent on, for example, Jonathan Demme's Philadelphia. Tom Hanks is a gay man who needs a lawyer. So he goes to a homophobic lawyer played by Denzel, you know, who then gets to heroically overcome his prejudices to help the poor alone gay guy. But actually in real life, people went to gay lawyers. You know, because we had a community that joined together. And interestingly, in Angels in America, you have the guy who abandons his lover, which, you know, it happened, but rarely. The real abandonment was people's families abandoned people with AIDS and gay people. So you have this like treacherous, betraying homosexual, you know, which really fit in with a lot of cliches at the time. If you're gay, you're going to be alone and gay relationships don't last and all of those kinds of cliches. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, when works are heavily, heavily rewarded and they represent highly oppressed groups, usually there's something in the representation that makes the dominant culture very comfortable. Same thing with Dallas Buyers Club. You know, buyers clubs were run by gay people. They were not run by straight people. You know, so you see these motifs over and over and over. And it would be, it would be nice to see work about AIDS that was accurate. Okay. Um, does do any of our members have questions for Sarah? And this is such a rich topic and we've covered so much. Um, okay, so somebody here knows Donna Binder, so that's great. That's yeah, there's some, a few things in chat actually, yeah. Okay. Um, no, mid 80s St. Clair's was the only hospital. No, I don't think that's true. Um, People with AIDS were in every hospital in the city. There was only one funeral home that would bury people with AIDS and that was Redden's on 14th Street. They're still in business. Um, Jim Lyons, yes. I interviewed Jim Lyons and you can watch. His. So Jim Lyons was uh, a film editor. He's dead now. And he was also Todd Haynes' boyfriend at one point. And his story is included both in the uh, interviews and in my book. I have a whole section on filmmakers. There were so many filmmakers in ACT UP. Um, Tom Kalin, Maria Magenti, Christine Bashan, so many people, um, Todd Haynes, et cetera, and Jim Lyons. So what do, you, what, what do you think about Todd Haynes' representation in SAFE of, you know, that's sort of like a, a sublimated way of thinking about uh, AIDS during that time period, but it's such an interesting movie. Do you think that that's more, I, I don't know what the word I keep going back to is honest, but I don't know if that's a word it's that you It's not that. It's not like artists should make whatever they want. Right. But the question is, what is the reception? When there's, a, when there's a work that shows gay people betraying and abandoning each other and everyone in the country is saying how brilliant it is, what does that reception really mean? You know, I mean, as an artist myself, I don't want anyone telling me what to do and I certainly wouldn't tell anyone else what to do, but you have to do, be a good materialist and analyze the reception. What do historians most get wrong about the ACT UP movement? Um, well, it's been recently mishistoricized as a handful of individuals. And actually the ACT UP movement was quite large. The meetings would have three to 700 people every week. My book, I cover 140 people. Our largest demonstration was 7,000 people. So, you know, five individuals can do a lot, but they can't accomplish what a large coalition can accomplish. And in America, things get changed by coalition. Yes, there's Redden's Funeral Home on 14th Street. I went to many, many, events there, many funerals there. And I also have to say that what I got out of reading um, Let the Record Show, like you said before, is that ACT UP, even though you're focusing on New York, that it went to Puerto Rico, that there's this Haitian community and that there's all these ties that start to, to go out and sort of think about this as 
a global disease rather than, some, like you say, an isolated uh, disease. Yes, the Haitian story, I didn't know it until I started interviewing people. Because one of the things about ACT UP was everyone was so busy that people really didn't know what each other were doing. And most people thought that what they and their friends were doing was ACT UP. So when I, we started interviewing, we saw how broad it was. So when Aristide, President Aristide was overthrown by a military coup in Haiti, a lot of Haitians fled to the US. And when they arrived, a, number, a large number of people were HIV positive. And the US government did not want black immigrants. So they put them in Guantanamo. I don't know if people realize that that's what Guantanamo was used for before it was used for political prisoners, Muslim political prisoners. So uh, when the Center for constitutional rights sued to get them freed, they needed to have housing in order to be released. And ACT UP's housing committee was very involved in trying to find housing for Haitian HIV positive people so that they could get out of Guantanamo. And that story is, is told in the book, I think for the first time. The Normal Heart. Yes, so that was Larry Kramer's play. The thing about The Normal Heart that's quite interesting is that it was really accurate to that milieu. The story it told was accurate for those people. Uh, but, and you know that unlike some of the other works that we've discussed, it was produced at the public theater and then it lay dormant for many years until finally there was a Broadway revival and then it was done on HBO. But by the time that happened, telling the true story of AIDS, as long as the people were white males was totally placid. It didn't have any, it wasn't challenging or threatening to the status quo. You know, so it takes so long for, for certain stories to be told truthfully. And the challenge is to tell them as they're happening. Like we're watching, we're seeing that now with Palestine. We're seeing how te American television will not accurately cover what's going on in Palestine or the New York Times will not accurately cover it because that is the moral issue of our time. And, you know, year, maybe in the future, the story will be told. And that's what happened with AIDS. It was repressed in its, in its moment. So some of our uh, attendees, you're raising your hands. We're glad that you're engaged, but could you please type your questions into either the Q&A or into chat um, so that we can, technically we don't have to sort of try to. Right, uh, parents, I want to address this. So familial homophobia is a great force of history that has been under examined. And certainly a huge impact on urbanization. People had to leave their countries, had to leave their towns. Many people with AIDS and gay people were abandoned by their families entirely, which is why the first five years of AIDS had to do with recreating social service networks. Um, in ACT UP, there was only one parent, Patricia Navarro, who was Chicana, who came, her son Ray died of AIDS and she joined ACT UP, but she was the only parent of a person with AIDS who joined ACT UP. Um, familial, if familial homophobia had been different, then the families of people with AIDS would have been a political force, but they were not. They, they, people with AIDS were abandoned by their families. Okay, promise. Well, you mentioned, Sarah, that you were really surprised that uh, one particular Black family that embraced um, both their, they mentioned that when their, there was a niece or something, that when her uncle won this particular reward oh, or something. Sarah Saint, that's right. Yeah. Soto Saint was a Haitian performance artist and playwright in New York. And when he died, he was, his body was at Redden's funeral home. Um, his family did a memorial service and it was the only time I saw a family that knew the names of all their friends, of their son's friends. Usually if families came to a memorial service and this was, they were shocked because they thought that their son was alone. And then they would come and there would be all these people who they had never heard of talking about how revered and respected and loved their son was, their son who they had shunned. But in a Soto Saint's case, his family knew all his friends. And I remember at one point, a relative, a young woman in a plain cotton dress, young Haitian woman came up and she said, when my cousin received an award from the Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Organization, I was so proud of my cousin." I can't tell you how rare that was. Gay accomplishment was considered not an accomplishment. It, you know, being, re being respected and appreciated in your community was not considered valid. So that was very, very rare. 
I don't know when the center will reopen. I'm not up to date on the AIDS vaccine, I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been really uh, eye-opening and uh, I just really am appreciative of you sitting down with us and talking about your work. And I urge everyone, I'm gonna put the, uh, Sarah's book again, the link to uh, Sarah's book, Let the Record Show. Uh, like you just heard in these different stories, it's, it's eye-opening, it's sometimes frustrating, <laughs> it can make you angry at the inaction and indifference of, of the greater community. But like Sarah said, there, were, there was a community that was supporting one another. And so it does give you something to really feel proud about in, in this uh, moment, this month of pride where we celebrate this history. Is there anything that you would like to say as the final word, Sarah? Well, I just wanna say that I hope this is the beginning of the accurate story coming out and that people who wanna make change will learn, how, learn from ACT UP and let themselves learn from queer people and people with AIDS. Um, and I'm very excited about that. And in the past, trying to tell the story was impossible. And so for the first time, people are open to hearing it. But just, you know, one of the things is people say, what's the difference between AIDS and corona, the, um, COVID? And, you know, COVID has been a collective public experience. It's been discussed on TV and we all talked to each other about it, but AIDS was our private nightmare. And our fight was to get it out into the public. You know, and um, that's a very significant difference. Anyway, thank you all so much. I'm really. I'm also going to put in the link, Sarah, uh, the 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 documentary that you did with Jim uh, had. Oh, I'm sorry, what's his name, Jim? Uh, Hubbard, United in uh, Anger. United in Anger, yeah. So that's more some what of a more condensed version of the great work that you've done and let the record show. But it might be something that people tonight can immediately access because it's free. Right. It's well, free on YouTube, and I will email Stan about um, Donna Binder. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. That was really great. Thank you. That was wow, Kevin. Kudos. That was just amazing. <laughs> I was actually I was taking notes. <laughs> I was writing stuff down. Um, this is such a great important discussion really really um wow that's 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 great i i i'm just i have to say every time we get these these speakers in every meeting i'm i'm always thrilled by um by what we can do so thank you thank you thank you that was really great and everyone yeah who put in your questions um you know thank you and this is yes kevin this is recorded and um we can you can watch this again and share it. Uh, actually, I actually have a friend of mine, uh, Andy, who, who's who's at, at the meeting was asking about sharing it. Yeah, all our meetings are public, so you're welcome to share it with people too. I mean, you may have friends and colleagues who want to hear more about this story. So, yeah, by all means, please um, share the link once it's posted. And Jeremy usually posts it up in like two days, not even. It's gonna be it's gonna be right there. So, Kevin, yeah, and you're. You're just like the best interviewers. I want a Kevin Lawrence talk show and have you having these interviews because your questions are also so meaty. I don't know. I mean, I'm just like, oh, bye. Here, here he comes with a question. I, I, I'd have to be on my toes if you're ever interviewing me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. That was great. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in a tizzy about that. So, but we're going to get to our educate, uh, to our committee report. So our first up is education. So Nina, let me bring you on. Just give me a second. Yeah, I got a little um, worked up. That was really, that was really, really great. So um, Nina, you're coming on in just a moment. She should be here. So oh, where is she? So Nina, if you... She seems to have disappeared even from my list. Oh, there she is. All right. Yay, Nina. Okay, so Nina, we can't hear you yet. Got my unmute and my video. Okay. Here we go. Clicking on my video. Oh, there. Oop. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps. All right. Hi. hi. Hello. Okay. Live from the East Village, <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you, Kevin, and uh, for the guest speaker, Sarah Shulman. 
And uh, our next guest speaker uh, is going to be Eric uh, Metzger, uh, a civil engineer, and so uh, on civil in, civil engineering sites. And uh, Mel Wasserman will be introducing them. But if you have an idea for a guest speaker, from please let us know. And uh, you get to introduce the guest speaker. Uh, usually we'll have someone be the panelist, someone from the education committee. We have such great people. We have Bob Gelber and we have also Kevin Lawrence and Jeremy Wilcox. And of course, John Semlack, four board members, and then our patron saint of education, Emma, and lots of support from uh, Michael Morgenthal and such. So um, uh, upcoming FAMS tours, uh, uh, we have in-person tours, no, no Zooms. So this is, uh, the New York is opening up, and I think there may be some slots available. Uh, we have a Bushwick street art tour with Jeremy Wilcox. And that's on June 4th, that's uh, two days from now. What's happening in Gowanus uh, with Elliot Niles, uh, and that's June 11th. June 12th, East Village Music Venues of the 1970s. And uh, that's with Anne McDermott. And that is an encore. So if you signed up for her tour, weren't, weren't able to get on it. And I think there may be one or two slots. So what I notice with education is sometimes the tour is sold out, but when you get right near the day before, there's always a couple of cancellations. People get sick, they, they all of a sudden have something to do, but that gives you a chance to take the tour. So, you know, don't, don't give up. There, there may be a couple of cancellations. Uh, also coming back, uh, very popular tour guide, Joe Sayflack, uh, Sunset Park Immigration and Landmarks. And that's June 17. Now, Joe does small, amounts of people, like usually eight. And so he uh, does wonderful gift to GANIC members. He will do his tour again and again and again if there's interest. And uh, if you look in the, um, in the notice, you'll notice some other dates that the tour is available. So even though we we don't put we don't do the registration on our GANIC site, uh, you can contact Joe directly, Joe Savak at live.com. I think that's his email. Uh, also coming up, John Semlag and Bob Gelber, two dynamos on the education committee. And of course, Bob's vice president and John Semlag's secretary, they are organizing a wonderful program honoring the 20th anniversary of September 11th. And just good news, we're doing this also, some of the programming will be in conjunction with our sister guild, the DC Guild, and we really are very happy that we're all going to get together again. Another thank you, uh, I always said thank you for last month's FAMS, uh, which we attach the minutes all the time. But I want to say thank you to uh, the DC Guild for inviting us to the grand opening of the National World War I Memorial in DC. And that's on Zoom. And so if you missed it, uh, it was on, on May 14th. Uh, GANIC members can access that link. Well, I'll talk to DC about it, see if we can get the link, you know, link up for you. But that was wonderful. Um, and I'm happy that they'll be joining us again. Um, so we thank all the other FAMs that happened. We, we have a running index July, uh, just yesterday, Uptown in the Heights with Manuela Biondi. And then uh, Midtown Historic Hotels with Amy Cook was May 2nd. May 7th was Victorian Flashbook, Flatbush with Jeremy uh, Wilcox. Marvelous Murray Hill, Where Do the Horses Go? was with Robin Gar and East Village Music Venues was started May 22nd with Ann Mc German. So we're always, we have an index and if you missed a tour and you want to take that tour, feel free to contact the tour guide. Then maybe they'll organize, you get a bunch of friends together, they'll organize it, you know, for you being a GANIC member. And uh, I, I guess that's about it if anyone has any questions, but I'm really grateful. We have a wonderful education team. Also Susan Birnbaum, Lisa Puccio, Minna Sharp, and uh, our, our next ed meeting will be on June 22nd. That's a Tuesday. So if you have any questions or, you know, let us know. Great. Thank you so much, Nina. And really, education always does such wonderful things. And don't forget, everyone, if you want to do a FAM, there's the form on our website. You just fill that out with your proposal. It goes right to education. They can see exactly what you want to do. And, um, you know, it's a great way just to 
to warm up again, you know, practice getting out and speaking in front of people and who better that to do it with than your fellow guides. So thank you so much, um, Nina. So I'm going to take you off now. And then um, Patrick, you're up for government relations. Hello, everybody. Yes, it's election time in the city of New York. Woohoo. This is a big one for us. Um, we know, of course, that Gannick has been pursuing ratification of Initiative 289A uh, due to the incredible work performed by this committee over the years. We have 30 sponsors to that bill. And the bad news is we're probably going to lose most of those sponsors with the coming election cycle because many of those sponsors are now termed out. So you will be hearing from the Government Relations Committee through email and our own social media. We're going to push to try to get this initiative taken out of committee and voted upon. There are 31 sponsors. And while that is not veto proof, we believe it is enough to carry the motion forward. And it'll go a great deal toward protecting the guides, uh, the jobs of guides on double decker buses. But shh, don't tell them that. We can't tell them it's about guides. It's about protecting personnel on the upper deck of a bus. And guess who that would be? So that's what we're working on. That's one of the things we're working on. Additionally, the Government Relations Committee will be reaching out to all the, mayor, um, all the major mayoral candidates prior to the primaries, eight Democrats, two Republicans. We have specific questions regarding their commitment to tourism in the city of New York. As we get these responses back, we will be releasing that information to the membership. I can tell you right now that of the 10 requests for information sent out to the campaigns, we have received emails of interest from Catherine Garcia and candidate Morales, for what that's worth. And uh, we'll have more details in the coming weeks. Uh, we won't be doing the city council questionnaires until after the primaries, uh, simply because of the number of people involved. It is simply not scalable. You can look at some of these council seats and have three, four, five candidates going for them. So we, in the interest of scalability and logistics, Council representatives will be reached out to after the primaries. Uh, the only thing I can say in closing is the membership of the Guides Association moved mountains to get those 30 sponsors. We're going to reach out to you again one more time to push this over the hill to get this bill passed. We thank you, and we're going to go back in and ask you for your help again. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Um, so the couple questions. Um, oh. Yes, Stan and Mike already answered. Yeah, Gannick does not endorse political candidates. We are a five hundred one c three. We can c six. We can, but we have chosen not to expend that political capital at this time because of the size of our organization. We want to build, expand our membership, and speak with a louder voice the next time around. Mm -hmm. And Kit was wondering if you could briefly describe the bill for some of our new members. Um, 289A is a bill that will require the presence of someone licensed pursuant to the laws of the city of New York to be present on the upper deck of a double-decker bus. We've been able to sell this to those 31 council persons on a safety thing. We can't position it as protecting the jobs of guides. If we did that, we would run afoul of the certain libertarian aspects of uh, city council's council uh, that can't create a protected class of worker. But the way it, the laws are structured in licensing, covering double-decker buses and guides, the only one they can put up there is a guide. So it's a little bit of a backdoor, but it's solid, if that answers your question. I think, I think so. And then also with, um, as we said, we do not endorse candidates, but we are going to be in touch with everyone and let and to get their opinion, to try to get feedback from them on what they think of tourism and what they're going to do about it so you can make a, a judicious decision when you go to vote. Oh yeah, we will be getting that information out as soon as we get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, next up we have uh, Mike, who's going to talk industry relations. Great, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, a big focus of the committee for the last few months was the Guide Week event, which 
uh, went off and really was a smashing success. It far exceeded any expectations that we had when we started working on it. Uh, so I just wanna share some of the final numbers with everybody here because they are truly uh, just, we can't believe how well this was received. Uh, we had 407 registered tour guides from more than a dozen countries around the world, uh, including from all over the United States. Uh, and the success of Guide Week really continues to position Gannick as a leader in the tour guide industry around the globe. Um, and it was great to see so many guides from around the world participating. Uh, we had 12 educational sessions, which were very spot on for what's going on in our current climate. And uh, we had these 12 plus virtual tours from around the world, which were quite fun. I was able to pop into a few of them, not all of them. And our recruitment day featured 56 different companies looking for tour guides. So can't ask for much better than that. As far as registration goes, uh, if you're curious, uh, of that 407, we had 70 GANIC members register, 151 people who registered as members of other tour guide associations, and then 186 general registrations. Um, we're still finalizing the numbers at this point. There's still some, a few expenses waiting to come in, uh, but between the registrations and our four sponsors, GANIC's gonna net close to $10,000 from hosting or promoting or sponsoring Guide Week, whatever you wanna call it. Um, this was not our goal setting out. We didn't intend it to be a money-making venture, but we're certainly not complaining about it either, especially considering that we did lose a decent amount of membership due to COVID-19, um, people leaving the industry or, or whatnot. Uh, so we're absolutely thrilled about that. And a big thank you to our four sponsors, Travel Curious, Indie Travel, Peak, and a tour of her own. Uh, for sponsoring the event. All will be invited to become industry partners uh, with the fees waived for the first year or in Travel Curious's case, just reactivating their membership status, which expired uh, about a month or two before Guide Week. Um, you've heard me mention these names before, but there's really no way this would have been possible without the amazing hard work, dedication, vision, and generosity of GANIC member and industry partner, Mitch Bach, and brand new GANIC member, Nikki Padilla. So, um, and uh, this is not the end of Guide Week by any stretch of the imagination, which I'll talk about in a second. But I also wanna uh, thank the other people who volunteered their time to help out. Uh, if I left anybody out, I do sincerely apologize, but I do wanna mention as many people as I can. Uh, so Emma guest Gonzalez and Jeremy Wilcox for helping to publicize the event, and Emma for being our official MC. Uh, Jeremy, Adrian Cooper, Kevin Lawrence, and Matt Apter for being moderators on certain panels. Uh, Maggie Brown, Jerry Jastra, Bob Gelbert, and John Semlock for being facilitators for panels. Patrick Von Rosendahl, Gary Dennis, and industry partners Corey Schneider and Seth Camel for being panelists on different panels. And Megan Gilbreth for monitoring the emails as they were coming in during the week. So. Thank you guys for everything. Uh, we could not have had it, made it such an accessible event without you. Uh, as we said, there were 56 companies participating in the recruiting day, and hopefully it is starting to yield some, some work for you guys or some leads. Uh, if you do get any jobs from Guide Week, we wanna hear about it. We wanna hear the success stories so we can promote it uh, for next year's event. Uh, so if you were hired from a lead via Guide Week, please email industryrelations.org and let us know. Uh, we're talking about uh, what comes next. We're certainly planning to hold another event in some way, shape, or form in 2022, likely earlier in the calendar year, because uh, hopefully in May 2022, we're all so busy with tours that the idea of doing a week-long program would just be my, you know, just a non-starter. So uh, we're still in discussions about that. Uh, it could also possibly be more of a hybrid event with some in-person and virtual event, virtual elements, but uh, we're gonna start talking about this uh, after the summer. So uh, stay tuned for that. Now, uh, it took a little longer than we had hoped, but the videos for the sessions are now available to all those who register. Uh, an email went out today and the link is here as well. This will only work if you paid to register, if you paid to attend the conference. Uh, so if you click on this link, you might have to log in again with the same credentials that you use to access all of the different things for Guide Week, but uh, that is where all of the sessions uh, that were recorded are housed, and uh, you can check them out at your leisure. As a reminder, the uh, virtual tours were not recorded, just the educational sessions. And an email, like I said, went out with this link, as well as a survey on how Guide Week went, uh, and uh, we certainly want as much feedback as possible. This was the first time we really attempted anything on such a scale, 
And we know certainly as well as it went, there are things we can do differently and things we can do better moving forward. So the best way to give us your feedback is to just take two minutes and fill out that survey. And like I said, the email went out today. Um, last but not least, keep checking back to Guide Week and to the Campfire platform. Uh, in that email that went out today, there was a list of uh, at least six free videos that are on the Campfire site. Uh, and that's all coming via Mitch's um, trip school business and the Campfire platform, which he built. So uh, tour operators are going to keep checking in at, on those profiles uh, as Campfire continues to grow. So keep those updated as well. And hopefully this will become a, a living, breathing thing that will uh, certainly uh, be a big part of what the tour industry becomes moving forward. And Gannick is right there at the front of it, which is pretty amazing. So again, thank you to everybody who uh, helped get this off the ground and make it such a great event. A uh, couple of other things, uh, Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. Uh, I've seen uh, a few uh, reports on social media of tour guides being treated rudely by National Park Service staff uh, when at the Statue of Liberty or specifically at Ellis Island and uh, in particular doing this in front of their tour guests. Uh, I do want to remind everybody who leads tours to the islands that we do have to follow the National Park Service rules but we shouldn't be treated, we should be treated like the professionals we are and not yelled at or berated like children. Uh, so if you are any New York City tour guide colleague, whether it's a Gannick member or not, has some sort of negative experience with uh, National Park Service staff on either Liberty Island or Ellis Island while conducting a tour, please email industryrelations at gannick.org. We're gonna start documenting uh, and recording all of these and aggregating them. And when we have, uh, if we have evidence of this becoming a recurring problem, we'll go to NPS and say, this has to change. Can't guarantee any behavior, any change of behavior on their part, but certainly by registering the complaints, at least we get it on the record. The other thing I'll say is if an NPS staffer approaches you and you're having a negative uh, interaction with them, start taking video of it. You know, there's no reason why you can't. And uh, we can use that video in many, many ways if it comes to it. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. Um, next up, uh, we heard before about the great news about in-person fam tours and a happy hour. Uh, we are working to return to in-person membership meetings. Uh, the first targeted date for the in-person membership meeting will be our annual general meeting on Thursday, September 9th. And committee co-chair Bob Gelber, along with committee uh, uh, guiding spirit, for lack of a better term, Harvey Davidson, have been working hard to find venues for us to return, not just on uh, Thursday, September 9th, but uh, moving uh, forward after that. And I just want to remind everybody that the AGM will not be on a Wednesday. It's going to be on Thursday, September 9th. We traditionally have it the week after Labor Day, not the first week of September. And the second uh, and the Wednesday after uh, Labor Day this year happens to be the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah. So we moved it one day to Thursday, September 9th. As we're starting to move forward, if you have suggestions for a meeting location, again, please email industryrelations at gannick.org. Uh, that email goes to myself and to Bob as co-chairs of the committee. Uh, and please include contact information, as I, as I always say. Don't just say, hey, let's have it at the Marquee Theater. Uh, we need contact information. Uh, one other thing from Harvey, uh, he participated, he represented Gannick on a call with Lucy Zachman. I hope I'm pronouncing that name pr uh, properly. She is the Director of Digital and Customer Experience for the MTA, and they discussed ways to collaborate on promoting tourism. Harvey discussed the Tour Your Own City campaign, bringing back the FunPass MetroCard option, which if any of you know, Harvey has been a pet project for him for many, many years, ever since they got rid of the uh, FunPass. Uh, they also discussed our industry partner program and having possibly having the MTA present at a future meeting. Uh, so he reported it was a positive discussion and expects to hear back from Lucy uh, and or others from the MTA on these issues is in the next couple of weeks. And as always, thank you, Harvey, for your tireless promotion of Yannick and for tour guides. Uh, last but not least, uh, we skipped the May committee meeting because I was kind of fried after guide week and got busy with a few other things. But uh, probably tomorrow I'm going to look to schedule uh, another committee meeting towards the end of June. As always, uh, we're always looking for more people to participate. There's always more that can be done. So uh, if you are interested in participating in our committee, once again, please email us at industryrelations at gannick.org. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mike. And thanks again for Guide Week. It was such a success. And when I've spoken to um, people who are not in Gannick, but are, who are in the tour guide and tourism world, they've all said 
oh, Guide Week was amazing. It was amazing. And we got a bunch of new members too. I and mean, we had a, quite a few people who, who applied to join GANIC. There were, there were. Um, right. Sort of we, we offer the same incentive that we had in past years for uh, non GANIC members who were attending. Uh, the same thing we did at the, the job fair, whereas if they uh, attended Guide Week, paid to attend Guide Week, they, um, uh, their initiation fee was waived if they applied to be a member of GANIC. We thought that was a nice little incentive. And every year it has yielded uh, new applications, and it's great that it happened this year as well. Yeah, so great. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to actually seeing the videos. Actually, there's a question for you from Sarah. Wait. Yeah, I see that. Uh, is there a way to pe for people to, we're not able to attend Guide Week to sign up for Campfire, or will we need to wait to access for another event that includes access to the platform? Uh, Sarah, that's a great question. I know they're kind of doing a soft rollout on Campfire. Um, you know, Guide Week was kind of like the big first test of Mitch's platform, but I will reach out to Mitch and see uh, what the next steps are. There's some, like I said, there's a few small notes uh, in the email that went out to the registrants. Obviously that doesn't uh, uh, help people who didn't register already, uh, but I'll, I'll reach out to Mitch and see if there's any uh, way, uh, I'm sure there are ways to sign up uh, after the fact and uh, we'll share that uh, on social media and um, can email you directly as well. Oh, Emma, you're muted. Sorry, um, Jonathan Tor asked about a registry of incidents on Liberty Island and Ellis Island going forward or in the past to just, just. Uh, I mean, I was thinking more going forward, but it can't hurt to have incidents in the past. If you have specifics, it, you know, we can't just say a tall ranger accosted me on a Friday in May, you know, names are better, uh, times are better, locations are better, subject matter are better. If you have that kind of recall, absolutely, we want to hear about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, we don't know if this has just been once or twice, or if this has been a, a huge issue going on. Uh, obviously when the rules first went in, there were some reports of some, uh, unprofessional behavior towards tour guides. And now that we're kind of hitting reset after COVID now would be the time to try to address it before it becomes like entrenched behavior. So yeah, absolutely. Jonathan, if you or anybody else, uh, has specific recollections of, uh, uh, run-ins with NPS staff, uh, let us know and we'll see what we can do about it. Yeah, I think Jonathan has the receipt, so we shall see. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mike. All right, I'm going to bring Derek Chan on to speak to us about membership. So he should be here in just a moment. Oh, I see something in the Q&A. Oh, name, time, location, shield number, specific issue. Yes, get, get the details, please. All right, so Derek be coming up in just a moment. Oh, it didn't seem to work. All right, let's see. Sorry about that, it wasn't clicking. Derek, I'm promoting you to panelist and, okay, now it's working. No, nothing's happening. Derek, I keep promoting you to panelists, but I think you have to accept it or... Yeah, let me, so, well, Derek, I'm going to put you on so that you can speak at least. Let's see what's happening here. Derek, can you speak up? Can you hear us? Because it's not going through for some reason. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, trying again. No, nope. well, let me move on. Let's see, because, oh, there we go. Derek, are you coming in? He keeps getting kicked out again. So Derek, I'm not sure why you're not coming on as panelists. I'm going to try and like one more time. And I'm also going to bring Dave Gardner on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Derek, you're, I can see you're here, so take it away. I see you're outdoors. <laughs> yeah, I was out and about. Hope you guys can hear me all right. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, just want to say hello and welcome to everybody that's here joining us, whether you're a 
you're visiting us uh, uh, virtually now in the present time or in the future. And whether you're a member or not, we're always glad that uh, you're here. And if you're not a member and are interested in becoming a member, um, it's very easy to do so. Everything is done online. You can just go online to our website, ganic.org slash membership, or you can also send me an email, membership at ganic.org. If you have any questions about that, as I mentioned, it is very easy to do. And if you are already approved as a member, um, but haven't yet paid your dues, make sure to log into your account and uh, pay for your invoice there. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on membershiporganic.org uh, to me as well. If you want to welcome a few new members that we have, we recently added three new provisional members, uh, Mike Burns, Jeremy Lechson, and Nikki Padilla-Rivera. Welcome, new provisional members. We also want to welcome back uh, provisional member Robert Fields recently rejoined us. Uh, glad to have you back. So that does bring our total current GANIC membership to um, 317 members, which is great. We are growing. We are continuing to add new members uh, each and every month. So as I mentioned, if you are uh, interested in rejoining or becoming a new member, uh, we're always welcome to have you. And it's uh, pretty easy to do so. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask me now or later on. Uh, just shoot me an email, membership at GANIC. Dot org. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. I hope you're having a nice walk wherever yeah. you are out there. Okay, I'm going to bring in Dave Gardner now and I'll take Derek back to being a. All right, here we go. All right, so Dave should be coming in. All right. So Dave, let's see. Just letting Dave got it on. I think a couple of people having issues with. Here we go. All right, Dave. So we can hear you. We cannot see you, but we do. I think we can hear you now. Hmm. Cannot see me, eh? Uh, hmm. Hey, you can hear me, yes? Yes, we can. Hmm, how about that? Well, uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. It's old Dave here calling in, and I'm representing the newsletter committee. And it, the new issue is now out. I'm holding it up, but uh, since I'm not on, uh, thank you, uh, El Presidente. This is our new newsletter. And uh, so that's out. And it's available to anybody who has wanted to be on the mailing list, which is not everybody. So you must do it uh, of your own volition. And please contact our very excellent co-committee uh, person, Linda Fisher, who has been very invaluable in the whole thing. <laughs> And thank you. And uh, so uh, typically you have two months to turn in material for the next one, but we're, uh, we've altered our dates a little bit this time. So you now have one month. So the next deadline will be June 30th, the end of this month, Wednesday. Great, great. Thank you very much. So everybody, June 30th, thank you, Dave and Linda. And I have to say, it's it's chock full and the nice thing is all the photographs and the best thing about i mean i'm i'm biased but the best thing was thank you for including jeremy <laughs> uh, the other jeremy or the, the furry orange jeremy not our wonderful uh, treasure but my cat jeremy but also you, everyone, you can see this online and the the pdf um in the Gannett documents of course is all in color which makes it a lot a lot of fun too so thank oh. you Dave. And yeah, and, people, and if you want to um, to submit something, you just send it to Dave, newsletter at gannick.org. And um, he and Linda will be happy to work with you. So June 30th is our deadline, you said? Yes, see, and I'll put out an announcement about that anyway, yes. Yep, okay. Uh, but there's been great events and great tours, uh, future and past. I see some great tours listed. So folks, you know, put, uh, put fingers to keyboards and uh, send it in and we'll run it. Yeah, and I think it'd be nice to have a piece about, you know, maybe a guide's perspective perspective of the city reopening on um, how, how you feel about that and how you feel about getting out and about. That would be something I think that a lot of people would be interested in reading or you may be interested in sharing. So thank you very much for that, Dave. Thank you. Great um, topic. Oh, there you are. Now we can see you. <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> Better late than ever. Yes, there you do it. When you hold it up, it's a little. <laughs> and I have put the uh, the 
email in the comments section and uh, I'll put it in the announcement anyway. So uh, that'll be us. And so that's the newsletter and it'll be out soon enough. Yeah. Uh, so the deadline will be the end of this month for the beginning of the next month after for the end of the next month after that. Okay. All right, that sounds great. So, um, and, and and Dave, you're getting a lot of compliments about your wonderful radio voice. It's very, <laughs> it's very, it's really. You're gonna have to do some recordings here. We'll have Dave. Um, you know, we've got so many wonderful, wonderful vocal skills here with our in our organic group. So, thank you. Very kind. Yeah, and so if you're if we don't see you, the voice is wonderful. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Muchly. Okay. All right. So, um, let me see. So uh, that's our agenda. Is there any? business that anyone would like to bring up if you um, could please put that in the chat or in the Q&A does anyone have something urgent something pressing that um, you'd like us to discuss now we're happy to do that don't forget you can always email the board with anything you need so it's board at ganic.org very very easy board at ganic.org and um, you know we're always listening we're always there um, and ready to help you out so um, I think that's it. Anything else from the board? I think you guys are ready. All right, this is good. 7.30, it's still light outside. I love it. Okay, can Gannick advocate for more PUA? Not really. Um, we don't have that kind of political clout. I wish we did, but um, it's really not not um, not what, what we're able to do, but it would be nice. But Ga Jared, you know, contact your representative, your voice as a Bozier and as a uh, as a constituent, that counts. That's what really counts. Um, much more, um, you know. Gannett can't really do much. And yes, Happy Belmont Stakes Week. I hope. Um, what's your name? The poor horse is not being pumped up with drugs. Oh, and yet let's get go. Let's go Knicks and Nets. I'm waiting for football to start, so I'm not quite sure about all these sports. Uh, Madam President, I just want to bounce back to Gerald Gerald Goldstein's question about the PUA. You're correct in that it's something that we on organic level cannot do, but activity that high up is being carried out by US travel. It is a lobbying issue for US travel. It is being dealt with on the national level through that organization. And we are on their mailing list. If there's any movement or request for assistance, we'll be all over it. We're aware of it, we definitely are. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Patrick. It's a good reminder. Yeah, US travel, the US Travel Association, they're the they're the big voice. You know, they actually get you know, get the meetings and people um, listen to them. So yes, and Kevin, you're right. Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride. Um, and it's, you know, we're proud of everybody all the time. So happy Pride, really get out, you know, get out your flags, get out there and reclaim Pride. I want to see that. I want need to check that out. I have a feeling my kids will be right down there right away. Um, somebody asked about missing recruitment week. Guide. Um, Mike, do you see the question from Stan? Do you have any advice about that? Uh, the only thing we can say, Stan, is you just got to log back into Guide Week uh, the same way you attended before. There is still a list of all the companies who participated. If you click on the names, it gives you a direct email address and you have to reach out to them directly. You can do that either with email or through the Campfire uh, platform directly. Um, and that's for everybody. You can feel free to do that as well. Um, so, But if you're having any difficulty, you can certainly let me know and I'll see if I can help. Yeah, um, yes, definitely go go into Campfire and check out if there's something that you missed, um, you know, during Guide Week. And like like Mike said, the videos are going to be up and they'll be available. And you know, all that contact information um, is accessible to you if you registered for Guide Week. You know, you'll be able to access that. And as Bob said, yes, the live meeting on September 9th, uh, um, an in person happy hour uh, coming up at the end of June. So stay tuned for that. Um, and yeah, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll see everybody out and about in the city and come up to the observatory, bring, bring a group. Why the heck not, right? All right, so thank you all so much for coming, for attending tonight. This will be posted soon so you can watch the discussion again, which is fantastic. Again, thank you so much, Kevin. Sarah was an amazing, amazing speaker. And everybody enjoy the rest of the evening. Enjoy the warm weather. And I'll see you all in, um, oh, hopefully I'll see you at the end of June. Otherwise, I'll see you for our next meeting in July. So be well, everybody. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.